Do you eat food? Do you like making money? If you answered yes to either of these questions, you are going to thoroughly enjoy today's episode where I sit down with billionaire Jim Mellon to discuss his new book, Moo's Law, which is all about the future of food and how we as investors can profit. CNBC has referred to Jim as Britain's answer to Warren Buffett, and he brings a wealth of knowledge to our very wide-ranging discussion. In this episode, we cover Jim's framework for the current market conditions, the future of food, human longevity, the revolution occurring in sustainable energy, and much, much more. I was honored to have the opportunity to sit down with Jim, and I learned a ton. So without further ado, please enjoy this discussion with Jim Mellon. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really can't wait for this discussion. There's a lot to talk about. All of it is really interesting to me. So I can't wait to dig in. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Trey. And I guess you're, you've got Scottish roots like I do as well with a name like Lockerbie, right? That is correct. My family heritage is 100% Scottish. Same here, 100%. Hey, Slanja. So Jim, let's get right down to brass tacks. With 2020 behind us, where do you see these markets going from here? Well, that is a very good question. And if I knew the answers, I probably would be sitting in the Bahamas rather than in Spain at the moment. But my general view is that we're in a very frothy situation. I imagine that you probably agree with me on that. I was intrigued that GameStop, for instance, doubled yesterday and then the after hours, but they're at it again, the Robin Hood boys and So I don't suppose that whole mania is over quite yet, but I can't believe that it's not too far from the end. My partner who's here, she represents some of the companies that are involved in this uh, area. And it's been a very hectic period for her because the amount of press coverage has been incredible. And, but it seems to be abating at the moment. I don't know. I, I, my own view is that you should stay very well clear of overpriced hype stocks at the moment. I think you'll just lose your money if you do so. So I'm assuming you're saying that because we're starting to see the interest rates rise. So do you think that we'll finally start to see a cyclical rotation back into value stocks? I think we've already done that. I mean, we've already seen that rotation back to value stocks. I mean, the tech stocks have been weak to flat for quite a period now. I'm actually short Tesla. I think that's going down by at least another 50%. And, but what I really look at is the money supply increase in the United States, which has been, at the beginning of the year, was phenomenal. As you probably know, it was close to 25%, which is you know, hyperinflationary style money increase at a time when the economy is probably, probably going to bounce back quite quickly. So I have all sorts of supply capacity constraints, which will lead to higher inflation. But the Fed is clearly doing something to abate that because the money supply growth has been much, much lower in the last two or three weeks, which is one of the reasons you're seeing the rise in interest rates. I would stay away from bonds. Do you think the US dollar probably has further to fall with volatility on the way? But your own market has been buoyed by massive amounts of stimulation, monetary printing and so forth. And it's got to end in tears. I mean, I've been around, I've been doing this now for... 30 something years. And I would say that this is up there with 2000 and also up there with 2007. We, we've, got a, we've got a big problem coming. Well, one sector in particular that's been especially beaten down lately is the financial sector. And you've had a lot of success investing in things like banks. So I'm curious, is now the time to load up on bank stocks? Well, that's a great question, Trey. I mean, my own view is that banks are something that you own cyclically, you don't own them for long term growth. And that's definitely been the right way to play banks. But I think that in the US, you've got some great community or or local banks that will probably be subject to acquisition as time goes on and, you know, are very high quality. And the US banks have been recapitalized since the financial crisis, the last financial crisis very well. They're not going to experience the level of fines and penalties that they had in the last 10 years. And they're probably good buys. In the UK, I've been accumulating Lloyds Bank, which is our biggest, for your listeners, is our biggest retail bank and mostly almost entirely exposed to the British economy, which I think will do quite well, actually, in the next uh, couple of years. They announced quite good results yesterday. I think they're on a P, prospective P of about four times. 
and a dividend yield of seven or eight percent. So I would load up on that. They're, like the US banks, they're Lloyd's is very well capitalized, so little danger that you're going to lose your, all your money and something like that. But, you know, you play it for a 50% rise and then you get out of it, as you would with the U.S. banks. So I also want to get your take on Japan because you've had a lot of success there as well. And Buffett recently announced that he's invested in the five largest Japanese trading houses. So what are your thoughts on that move? Well, I think he's a super smart individual. If you ask me, I started my career by investing working for an investment company that was investing in Japan a long time ago. And in 1989, not too long after I'd started work, the Japanese market hit its all-time peak, which has never been exceeded. And even though the market's been going up recently, it's still below the level it was. I don't know if you know this, Trey, but in after the war, whenever all the financial institutions in Japan were reconstituted, and I think I'm right, it was 1948, the Nikkei, index was called the Nikkei Dow Jones Index. And the reason it was called that was because it was aligned exactly with the Dow Jones Index. And so they were both then at about 120, if my recollection of it wasn't born, I wasn't around then, but if my recollection is correct, and for early period of my career, the Japanese index was I would say 20 or 30 times higher than the Dow Jones in the United States. So they have this enormous rise. And today, they're about the same level. The Dow is about the same level as the Nikkei. So Japan is a really interesting, it's very good that you asked that question, because I would say that Japan is absolutely going to have a further move upwards, partly because it's breached those horrible levels that were reached in 1989, and partly because Japanese companies are full of cash, partly because they're really good companies in many cases, and partly because Japanese savers have monumental amounts of money on which they're earning absolutely nothing. And now the Japanese companies are paying more dividends. So load up on Japan. I think that's a very good idea. Well, I know you've got your sights set on a number of other sectors as well. So why don't you give us a breakdown of, say, your top three? So basically, I look at investment as metathematic. So your big money will be made in something that you really research, that you really understand, and that you're early into, and that you have probably a diversified approach to. And then underneath that, there's the shorter term market stuff that you know we all do, like you do, Trey, and I do. And the shorter term stuff, the way I look at it, pays the daily bills and pay the salary of your employees or my employees. But the longer term meta thematic stuff is that stuff that will allow you and me to be solvent when we're much older. And in your case, that's a long way off. In my case, hopefully, I've still got a few years of productive life left in me. So in terms of meta themes, I think there are three massive meta themes at the moment. One is climate change. And the problem is that green energy and green themes are extremely highly valued in the stock market. And, you know, if you look at hydrogen companies or you look at uh, lithium companies or you look at solar panel industries of any type or wind farms or whatever, the, the yields or the free cash flow multiples on those are extremely high. So out of that one, the longevity industry is really interesting to me. And we have our own company, Juvenescence, which reflects that where we know that it's going to be possible to manipulate aging so that people can live longer and healthier. We just don't know exactly how that's going to happen. So we've taken multiple bets in Juvenescence, which is a company that's going to go public relatively soon. And then the last one is the revolution in agriculture, because we can't sustain the level of intensive farming around the world when the Indians and Chinese in particular want you know, huge amounts more of animal protein, which causes massive environmental destruction, human health problems, and pandemic. And so we need to find alternatives. So I've been metathematically investing and starting companies in that area. And then underneath all that, in terms of the day-to-day trading, I would say we're very high on the US market. We've got an opportunity in Japan as a positive feature. I think the UK market is extremely cheap for reasons I'd be happy to explain to you. And I think that overall, you should be out of bonds because the yields are, in some cases, negative and in many cases are negligible. And we're going into a period of inflation and that you should be 
position for a commodity super boom, which in the middle of, or we're not even in the middle of, we're in the early stages of, and my favorite metals, gold, silver, and platinum. I have a very simple approach to what's going on at the moment in the world. I think we can do very well over the next year or so. So I'm super excited about prospects of making large amounts of money in the next couple of years. Futurist Ray Kurzweil has famously said that humans will ultimately achieve immortality. Do you think he's right? And is it a good idea? No idea. I mean, it's like saying Bitcoin could go to $300,000 or a million dollars or whatever. I think that is, it's almost a headline grabbing statement. And it doesn't, frankly speaking, in my opinion, do the longevity industry any good because there have been multiple pronouncements over the last 5,000 years about some secret that will keep you alive forever, something that will, you know, an elixir of youth that will rejuvenate you. Nothing has worked. And even today, the anti-aging industry is about $150 billion around the world, and none of that stuff works. But what's happening is that since the unveiling of the human genome, scientists have discovered pathways of aging that cause even you, but especially me, to age. And those pathways can be manipulated in all mammalian species, and in, in, in many cases, including in us, to slow or to halt or to reverse the aging factors that those pathways cause. We are in the dial-up phase of the internet vis-a-vis -vis the longevity industry. It's very difficult to know exactly what's going to work, but I personally know that it is going to work, and it will be totally revolutionary. 1900, in your country and in my country, average life expectancy was about 47 at birth. Today, if you make it to 65, you're very, I mean, more than, you're like 95% likely to make it over 90. So the whole of our life expectancy and the way in which we conduct our lives has changed dramatically in the last 120 years. Now, none of that has occurred because of any pharmaceutical or therapeutic intervention. It's all because of better sanitation or vaccines or antibiotics, less infant mortality, et cetera, et cetera. Now we've got the possibility of actually changing our fundamental biology, allowing us to live to maybe 110 or 120. And that's my aspiration. But more importantly, to live those extra years in a robust and healthy condition, not sitting in a chair dribbling away, waiting for the Grim Reaper to come and, and take us away, but and not being sick with cancer or heart disease or diabetes or Alzheimer's or whatever. And that's the great prize that is here and now. And the science is catching up with the aspiration of all of us to have a robust and healthy life for a much bigger part of our lives, which may even be longer lives. It seems like a big component of the success of human longevity lies in the evolution of artificial intelligence. And Google's DeepMind, for example, recently had a breakthrough with AlphaFold that could have a very promising impact on the future of medicine. So does this make you inherently bullish on artificial intelligence? Yes, and, and obviously a part of Juvenescence is devoted to AI, largely to accelerate the process of drug discovery, so that, for instance, our affiliate company in Silicon Medicine based in Hong Kong can now, theoretically at least, develop a new compound, highly specific compound, in 30 days as opposed to the historical three years, and can also probably, in due course, develop a drug for you, personalized drug, or for me, personalized drug. I think AI is going to be a very big factor in accelerating the process of science, but it won't just be obviously for longevity, it'll be for all sorts of diseases, but AI depends on massive data sets. And those data sets are not as readily available as they should be. Funny enough, the UK is, has got the best data sets which are available to scientists because of the NHS and National Health Service, which is a unified system. And as a result, there is a very big compendium of information available for scientists in the UK, which I thoroughly encourage people to look at if they want to. Wow. So does that mean there's an inherent competitive advantage with European AI companies? I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think this is free to use for any scientific advance in the world. And there is no doubt, as in so many other areas, that the US is far, far ahead of other countries in terms of longevity science, food science, and the other areas that I'm interested in. The only area in which it may be being bettered 
is AI, where the Chinese seem to be possibly even ahead of the United States. And so, but generally speaking, the fount, the source of all the great technologies in the world is the US. And that should be applauded, really. So how do you see the timeline for the whole human longevity technology sort of unfolding? And what does it look like for big pharma along the way? Great question. So basically, my view is that within 20 years, life expectancy at birth will be 110 in the developed world. You will have the old paradigm of born, learn, earn, retire, and expire will be changed because people, they are, be learning as a continuum throughout their lives. Relationships will change, work patterns will change, etc. And so we're very, very close to that point. Years ago, I got a pilot's license and guy who was teaching me told me that if there's something in the distance that's a static object when you're looking out of the cockpit, it's coming straight at you. It may not look like it's moving, but it's coming straight at you. And that's the same with longevity. This is going to happen much quicker than people think. For even someone like myself, I think there's an extremely good chance. My dad's 92 years old, but I'll live to 100. You certainly will live to 100. And so you need to take into account your financial planning, your planning of all sorts of stuff. And we're almost there. We're almost there. So I'm, I'm extremely bullish, but I'm not bullish like Ray Kurzweil, who makes a very specific forecast. By 2040, the singularity will be here, which means that for every year that you live, you'll get more than a year of extra life. I think that that's, uh, I'm not saying, I think that's a wild prediction that I wouldn't have made. You mentioned your short Tesla and could see that going down quite a bit further, but they've also kind of become the poster child for this green revolution. So what other renewable energy companies might you be considering if you're bullish on the space? Another good question. I mean, basically, I I think that almost everything to do with the green revolution, while worthy and wonderful and great and obviously impactful and necessary, is too highly priced. The reason, I mean, I've got nothing against Tesla. You know, I wish I was Elon Musk, what a life he must live, is that even today at 700 and something billion dollars, it is worth more than every other car company in the world put together. And the folks at BW or BMW or Jaguar or GM or Ford are not stupid. They're catching up if they haven't already caught up very, very quickly. So to justify the current valuation of Tesla, you have to you know, have a remarkable view on their prospects. And I don't have that remarkable view. I think that Tesla, as I said earlier, could go down by 50% from this level quite easily. It'll be very jagged on the way, but it's a way overhyped, way over expensive company. And, and notwithstanding all the stuff about storing energy on power batteries and the solar panels on roofs and all the other stuff that Elon Musk might dream up in Tesla, it's expensive company. And they all those situations in my his, my experience always end up in tears. So from a renewable energy point of view, I don't think there's anything that I can see that's worth investing in. But if you look at what are the causes of emissions around the world? It's Transport is one of them, but the biggest cause is intensive farming. The biggest cause of you know, global warming is cows emitting methane into the atmosphere. It's as simple as that, along with pigs, chickens, ducks, which, by the way, are a, a big component of food supply in China, and sheep. And they are, and since the Second World War, increasingly intensively farmed. So in the United States, 99% of your agriculture is intensive, which means the animals get fed inside in feedlots and and quite often kept in fed what you and I would consider to be cruel conditions. But they're also the biggest contributor to global emissions, more so than transport. And you know, even if Elon Musk electrifies the whole world, we know that some of the electricity that goes into producing the electricity to fuel power the cars is bad electricity. But if we could cut the amount of food that was produced intensively, then we make a much bigger dent in global emissions at that point. So in the United States, again, the leader in technology and so many things, you've got the plant-based revolution that's taken off like a rocket with beyond and impossible and so forth. And actually, to be fair, in Europe as well, in the UK, you've got corn, you've got meatless farms, you've got Live Kindly and Oatly, which is going to go public quite soon. So that, that's the first wave of the revolution. But what I'm very interested in and why we are the biggest investors in the world in this particular area is in cellular agriculture, where you grow meat, materials, seafood in labs. And again, the leading companies are generally in the United States, but not entirely in the United States. But in 10 years time, 
You and I will be eating seafood that's made in a lab. We'll be eating meat that's made in a lab. We'll be eating, we'll be using leather that's made in a lab. We'll be using threads that are made in a lab. And this is here and now. It's all of these companies have a product. The question is scale up. That's my book. It's Moose Law, which has just come out, which is about this very industry and how you can, how investors can profit from it. And just as an aside, all the proceeds go to the Good Food Institute, which is the largest um, advocacy group for this in the world. It's necessary that we move away from eating animals that are intensively farmed because apart from the animal cruelty side, which was the basic appeal for me because I don't eat meat, the environmental destruction plus the pandemic risk. I mean, do we want to go through another pandemic that's caused by animal to human transmission because we've become bacterially resistant to antibiotics? because 80% of antibiotics go into farmed animals. No, we don't. So for heaven's sake, let's change the food supply. The technology is possible. It's here and now, and it's going to be on plates in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere in the world in the very near future. Well, I can hear how passionate you are about this topic, which I am also really excited to talk about. And you mentioned Beyond Meat, so I want to start there. So Beyond Meat's market value is already north of about $10 billion which is about half of another company like, say, Tyson Foods, for example. But Tyson Foods is producing $3 billion of profit, whereas Beyond Meat is losing hundreds of millions of dollars a year for now. But it begs the question, how innovative is Beyond Meat, given that incumbents like Tyson are already producing plant-based products? Well, I think Beyond's a great company. And for my book, Moves Law, I interviewed Ethan Brown, who I think is a super nice motivated, mission-driven person. And I'm a big fan of his. But what he's involved in is an industry that doesn't have a lot of IP protection, intellectual property protection. Because to be quite honest, Trey, you and I could set up a plant-based meat company tomorrow, and there are plenty of them around. And you're right, Tyson or Kellogg's or Unilever or Nestle, all the big food companies are doing exactly that. So he's got a lot of potential competition on his hands. The difference between what he does and what the cell ag can do, where they're growing food and materials in laboratories, is that they have special intellectual property that is robust and by patents. And it makes it very hard for Trey and Jim to go off and do exactly what they're doing because we would be litigated out of business. So this is why I prefer that. The other reason I prefer that is that plant-based meats are coming down in price, and they will probably come down to the price of conventional meats. They're not necessarily better for your health, but clearly meats grown in laboratories or seafood grown in laboratories have the capacity of coming down below the price of conventional meat, being better in taste, texture, and better for health because they won't have toxins, they won't have fecal material that's leaked into the product which in the United States, by the way, causes one in six people in the United States to be in bed every year because of food poisoning. They won't have antibiotics in them or hormones, or in the case of seafood, mercury or microplastics. So there is absolutely no reason why we, you and me, when we're allowed to and we can share a meal, won't do so eating lab-grown foods because they'll be just so much better for us and for the planet. Well, what you're referring to there is what you call in your book, Griddle Parity. And I just love that name. We'll be below Griddle Parity within 10 years. And Griddle Parity obviously is a riff like Moose Law is off an established indicator where grid parity is when the price of renewable energy goes below that or goes to the same level as fossil fuel derived energy. And it's the same with cell ag products. At some point, they'll come down to the level or below the level of conventional meat. And then the tipping point is all right. So in the US this year, you'll be close to a quarter of your milk market will be alternative milks. A quarter. It was nothing 10 years ago. And so Borden and Dean Foods have gone bust because they can't sustain the production of conventional dairy products when they have such effective competition on their doorsteps. And so I think this is right for everyone. And even the farmers can benefit for a whole load of reasons that are included in Moo's Law. But you know, within 10 years, that's not very long. You'll have at least half the meat market will be plant-based or cell ag-based, at least half. And I'm all for that. Don't get me wrong. But I do want to kind of pose the counter argument here because you know, there's a saying, 
that there's no free lunch. And while these products might be tremendously beneficial for the environment, do you have any concerns about what they're actually doing for our bodies? Because some of these products are downright junk food status. Oh, I think that's right. As I said earlier, I don't think that the plant-based foods are necessarily better for you than conventional meats. But the cell ag is completely different because that is the best of species grown in a lab to come out without any of the contaminants and E numbers and all the other stuff that you're referring to, quite rightly, uh, on the plant-based stuff. But I wouldn't say that the plant-based manufacturers aren't cognizant of that and aren't doing something about it. And we're seeing today, you know, for instance, Beyond is re-engineering its products all the time to be healthier, to have less saturated fat, to have less stuff that isn't necessarily very good for you. And so Ethan Brown was telling me that he he's going to keep producing better and better products that will be better for, for human health. So, but at the moment, you're right. It's uh, That stuff is not necessarily better for you than eating the conventional stuff. So in your book, you feature a few companies you're invested in in this space. For example, Blue Nalu, who is producing cell-based seafood and Mosa meat, plant-based meats. But you know those are private companies. So I'm curious, are there any other companies publicly traded that our audience could get involved in now or that you're keeping a close eye on? There aren't. I mean, the only company is Agronomics, which is, I'm the biggest shell of, which is a investment vehicle listed in the London Stock Exchange, which invests in this industry. But as yet, none of these companies have gone public. There will be, of course, companies that go public over the next couple of years. And in the book, News Law, I suggest the ones that you might want to be looking at from a public point of view, because I think there'll be great investments going forward. And among them, of course, is Blue Nalu, which is going to have a product on the US market by the end of this year, approved by the FDA, and will be a fabulous replica. It's not really a replica because it is, it's Mahi Mahi. And then they'll have Bluefin Tuna not very long after that. So it is incredible. You know, I wish I was closer in age to you, Trey, because I think that we are entering a period of such remarkable change and innovation. But for those that who, who can handle change, and not everyone can, this is going to be a remarkable period, not just of opportunity for investors, but also just as human beings, just the wonderful stuff that's going to happen. So with companies like Blue Nalu, who are doing this so-called cell-based seafood, tell us a little bit about what that is. Is it a 3D printed food? Is it grown in a Petri dish? What is it? I think the easiest way of presenting this is using a conventional meat example. So let's talk about cows. Seafood is exactly the same, by the way. But so let's say that you have a cow and it's living in your backyard and we want to, and it's a very good cow, you know, in every way it's very healthy. It's type of meat, not that you would ever kill it, but it's type of meat would be very favorable for us. So what we do is we go out to the cow, we take 2.5 milliliters, which is a tiny amount. It's less than, it's like a nail, right? A small nail worth of uh, fluid from it. And it doesn't even feel anything. We then take that, we extract the stem cells, which are the precursor cells, the one that make us grow from the babies or fetuses. And we differentiate those stem cells by bathing them in nutrients and growth factors become the cells that we want, which are the muscle cells, the connective tissue cells, and the fat cells to produce meat. Now, in a nutshell, that 2.5 milliliters sample can produce 3,000 kilos or nearly 7,000 pounds in meat, which is the equivalent of seven cattle. They would take 28 to 30 months to grow and feed lot, and we can produce that 3,000 kilos or 7,000 pounds of meat in 40 days. That's the process. So you take the genetic code, effectively, of the cow. You don't modify it at all. There's no genetic modification. You bathe it in the same kind of nutrients as if a cow was sitting in a feedlot or was in a field. You use growth factors, which are well-known growth factors, and you grow it in large stainless steel containers that are known as bioreactors. You then put all the various bits back together and you have meat. And that's how it happens. So talk to us a little bit about the ancillary benefits of producing food this way. For example, the lack of water that's needed or the lack of produce or crops. 70% of all crops grown around the world, including those from the Amazon, 
former Amazon jungle, which has been cut down to grow soya beans and therefore causes even more environmental destruction and climate change, go to feed animals. They don't go to feed us. And those animals are very inefficient converters of plant protein into animal protein. So in the case of a chicken, it's about nine to one. And in the case of a cow, it's 25 to one. So it takes 25 times more inputs for the cow to produce one output of meat. Whereas in this process, the cell egg process, it's about two to one. You can already see how the price of lab-grown meat could be lower than the price of conventional meat. On top of that, as you rightly point out, Trey, each kilo of beef, and a kilo is 2.2 pounds, takes about 15,000 liters of water to produce. That's a huge amount of water. Farming uses more water than anything else in the world. And 80% of antibiotics go into intensively farmed animals to both keep them from getting diseases and also to promote their growth. So a chicken today, for instance, is three times bigger than the chicken that existed in 1950 because they're genetically engineered to grow much faster and they have miserable and short lives. And the average chicken lives 23 days before it's slaughtered. 23 days? The average dairy cow lives two years. Whereas in a field, it would live up to 25 years because it's constantly pregnant. Its back breaks because its others become so big from producing milk all the time. So this is a very cruel profession, very cruel industry. And it's all around the world. It's not just in the US or in Europe. It's everywhere. But the biggest risk is that you pump all these animals full of hormones and antibiotics, and they become carriers of diseases that move into humans. So the swine flus, the bird flus, and now the latest COVID-19 have all come as a result of close confinement of animals and the transmission of novel disease to humans. Do we want that or can we avoid that by doing something different? We can do something different. It's here and now. Why wouldn't consumers and everyone on the planet actually want that? Well, you're right. And I think theoretically, everyone does want that. And it does seem inevitable because it is basically inescapable that we need to convert to a plant-based or cell-based food in some bigger fashion moving forward just for sustainability purposes. But you know, I actually want to invert my earlier question asking about disruptors coming into the space because you know, you mentioned the incumbents in the auto industry versus Tesla. So I'm curious what your take is on the incumbents in the food space and how encouraging their progress has been in the space. Yeah, that's another great question. So basically, you've got companies like Unilever or Nestle or Danone or in the US, Tyson Cargill and the Brazilian company JBS, which are actually either investing in or partnering with some of these cell ag and plant-based companies because they know which way the right, you know, the writing is on the wall for them. And frankly speaking, these are large companies that will sell, I'm not saying they'll sell anything, but they'll sell any food that consumers want and that's legal and it's reasonably high quality, they don't necessarily have to sell it from animals that were slaughtered. So I think you're going to see more and more of these companies buying up or partnering with some of the companies that I mentioned in Moose Law. And in Moose Law, I talk about sold. I think a lot of these companies will be sold to the majors in the next uh, few years for their intellectual property, or they'll fold because of the, the way of the world, as we investors all know, is that some companies sometimes fail. Uh, or there'll be a few of them that are bold that will go out and create their own large brands like Impossible or Beyond have done. And if I had to say that my favorite in terms of creating its own large brand at the moment is Lunar Loon Seafood because it's closer to market and it's got a very good management team. But, you know, like everything in an early stage in the internet in the early years or longevity in current period, or in food today, you need to have a diversified portfolio. Don't put all your eggs or all your, all your food in one basket. It's better to diversify. So this reminds me of an old Warren Buffett quote where he was talking about the early days of the automotive industry. Because in the early 1900s, there were literally hundreds of automobile startups, and now there's only a handful. So picking a winner out of the bunch would have been very difficult at the time. And in Buffett's view, the better bet would not have been to go long cars, but rather to go short horses. So in this case, maybe we're shorting cows. But in any case, do you see sort of an analog to this here? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think that makes perfect sense. But it's not an easy thing to go because farms are normally owned by 
individual farmers are not you know they're not listed and i actually i haven't thought that's a good question i haven't thought about how you go short individual companies in this area i mean i think the nearest to it is jbs the Brazilian company, which is entirely dependent on farming cattle, but I, I wouldn't know how to. It's a Brazilian company. I wouldn't know how to go about that. I think it's much better just to invest in the positivity. I mean, those who went short GameStop on the basis that it was going, it was a dinosaur that was going to go bust, have lost a lot of money. So it's probably better just to be optimistic and go for the for the, the positive companies. But definitely short Tesla, even at, at seven hundred and fifteen today. The last time I looked, I think it will go to five hundred or below. Well, let's kind of touch on the bear case there because earlier you were talking about the negatives when it comes to electric vehicles and the bad electricity that is actually needed to produce the vehicles. And I'm not sure enough people really understand this. So what are the negatives for producing electric vehicles versus something like a hydrogen vehicle? A very good question. So basically, electric cars use a lot of, to be made, they use a lot of copper, nickel, and so forth that have to be extracted using a large amount of fossil fuel. When they're on the road, they use electricity, which is stored in the batteries. And that electricity is in many cases generated by using uh, fossil fuels and particularly coal. So although people might think that Germany is a green country, actually nearly half of its electricity is produced by the burning of coal. So, you know, when you're producing coal to make electricity that's used by Tesla cars, is that a green movement? I don't think so. And the same in the United States. I mean, you're using coal, you're using gas, you're using fossil fuels to produce a large amount of your electricity. The wind power, the solar panels are still a fraction, a small fraction of the electricity that's produced in the United States. Well, there's this old saying, you know, that during a gold rush, you actually want to be selling shovels to the gold miners, right? So with this major revolution into electric vehicles, What's your stance on taking a position in something like mining lithium or any of the other metals that you mentioned earlier? Great question. So lithium is the obvious thing. And, and obviously in the United States, you've got a, an issue with importing uh, rare metals and lithium from China. And you want to have a domestic and secure supply. So I've been investing. We have a company called Brad Ahead, which is actually named after the view from my house in the Isle of Man. And at some point in the relatively near future, we'll take that company public. It's got a lot of concessions in the United States for, for lithium, which I'm super bullish on, super bullish. So Jim, we've covered a lot of ground and ultimately I'm just left here wondering, what is your ultimate advice for someone who's just getting into these markets? Trey, you've asked some brilliant questions. I'm very much appreciative of you having me on the show. I will just say, in closing remarks before I go, as I was telling you earlier, the pub quiz that we host every Thursday night. It's a bit early for a pub quiz where you are, but it's the right time here, is that in my experience, for what it's worth, and you know, I don't think I'm a particularly innovative person. I've been a very competent plagiarist in my life. But in my experience, if you want to be a successful investor, you have to be curious. You have to read a lot. You have to listen to Trey's podcast. You have to listen to other podcasts. You have to just be persistent in listening and being have an open mind to all sorts of people. The second thing is you have to be adaptable. You and I know that things change on a dime. So we might be very bullish on, let's say, electrification today, but tomorrow hydrogen becomes the big thing. And we, we should look at hydrogen, which is coming up on the rails against electrification. I think they're all expensive, but that's the way that I try and think. Uh, and the last thing, and the, the most important thing possibly, is what I call application, which is basically hard work. If you don't put in the hours, you're not going to be a successful investor. You've got to actually really work at it. There are a few people who will luck out, but not many. I really want investors to succeed because our capital markets are the things that keep our societies together in a positive way. But they're not going to succeed if it's just becomes a casino. And the three things I just want to emphasize, number one, curiosity, adaptability, and application. If everyone can do that, then we're going to have some very success. I know you have a lot of listeners, some very successful listeners out there. Well, I think that's wonderful advice and a great note to end on. So Jim, before you go, I just want to make sure I give you an opportunity to hand off to our audience where they can learn more about you, where they can find your books, your companies, and any other endeavors you're involved in. 
Right. So there's a Moose Law book. That's the, it's all together in one word website. I would go on to that. You can get the book on Amazon or really any other, you know, book selling thing. And I think that's a good, good place to start. But I've really enjoyed talking to you, Trey. I, I appreciate you asking me. And from one Scotsman to another, fare thee well. <laughs> well, I had a lot of fun, Jim, and I really hope we get to do this again soon. Thanks for coming on the show. Anytime. I loved it. Thank you very much indeed. All right, everybody. For the next part of our show, we're going to take a question from our audience. So this question comes from Jeff McAllister. More specifically as to how you all think about these two issues, greed and fear, and any insights or perspective that you could provide in terms of how value investors should be thinking about managing these two. And uh, thanks for all you do for your community and uh, look forward to hearing from y'all. So Jeff, I really love this question because you're right, you're getting to the root of it, which is greed and fear. And the best advice that I could give you is the same advice that I actually received from Warren Buffett one time. And that was to go back and read chapters 8 and 20 of The Intelligent Investor, because those chapters are all about the human psychology factor when it comes to investing. And I know that from the outside looking in, especially for new investors, investing looks like just numbers, spreadsheets, formulas. But the revelation a lot of us investors have over time, right, is that, no, this is a very emotional roller coaster to put yourself through. And so it's no surprise that the best investors are also probably the most rational people you've ever met. But there's some other tricks you can do as well. So for example, a lot of the investing platforms allow you to change the colors. So for example, on a down day where it's all red, you can actually make it a green day to say, hey, this is a good time to buy. And beyond that, I would just say it's important to go back to basics a little bit and focus on the fact that you're owning the piece of a real business. And if you believe in the competitive advantages of that real business to endure the test of time, then it should be something that you can hold on to for the rest of your life. That's not always the case, but in the instance where things are going way up, sometimes I like to reflect back on, I think it's a Charlie Munger quote that says, don't just do nothing, stand there. Because again, if you believe in the core business involved, we're big believers on the show that theoretically you could hold them as long as possible. So Jeff, I hope that's helpful for you. For asking such a great question, we're going to give you free access to our intrinsic value course on the investorspodcast.com, as well as our TIP finance tool. And trust me when I tell you that these two things are going to help answer your question even further. And the tool itself is incredibly powerful. All right, everybody, that's all we had for you on this week's episode. Be sure to tune in next week where I sit down with Ted Seides to talk about how to invest like the best. And if you haven't done so already, go ahead and subscribe to the feed. Follow me on Twitter at Trey Lockerbie. Check out theinvestorspodcast.com. And especially if you haven't already done so, check out the dream tool we've built for you at TIP Finance. So with that, we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. Make sure to subscribe to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network and learn how to achieve financial independence. To access our show notes, transcripts, or courses, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 